within the, the, the teams themselves, when, when you realize that the cover-up of Roberts Ridge created a pattern by which criminal activity occurs and cover-ups result from that, that you start to realize the pattern is, is that there are people in power who are willing to manipulate the playbook that they know everybody, my brother, my brother, my brother, I will do anything for my brother. When so, they know that that is the mindset and they will get them to do anything to maintain their place in that brotherhood. No comment. <laughs> oh, he didn't kill Bin Laden. Probably blame me for being an idiot, but. And, which you were, which we all were. <laughs> you have to make it to where crime doesn't pay. You have to deter crime, whether it's crime or terrorism, it's the same principle. You have to clash with supervision. You have to or nothing will get done. Supervisors can't learn how to supervise and you can't learn how to respect a supervisor without confrontation. It has to happen. <laughs> Do not take that out. JV team for life. What's up, everybody? Just want to give a quick shout out to Zero Nine Holsters. These guys are cop owned, cop operated, cop tested. All right, based out of Ohio, um, they have gear for everything: holsters, equipment. I use them for magazines, radio. They have everything. So you can either order online through them, or you can go on their website and find who sells them in their shops. In case you're one of those people that wants to go and physically look at it. On this podcast, we talk about real important issues in our culture um it's hard to do sometimes uh you know and a, and a lot of people don't support us and don't want these messages out there zero nine holsters supports us 100 percent. they agree with everything they that we say and they're like we're down let's do it so by supporting them you're supporting us and uh so if you buy holsters or you know you need equipment holders radio anything you need Go to zero nine holsters, right? And when you check out, use promo code antihero ten z nine, antihero ten z nine. That'll get you ten percent off your order. So go show them some love. Thanks, guys. Don't say anything you don't want recorded forever. Oh, don't you run off saying the <laughs> again? <laughs> Nazi. Nazis. <laughs> 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 All right, y'all ready? I am ready. Welcome back to the Anti-Hero Podcast, part Delta Force, part Street Cop, all podcast. I'm your host, Tyler, owner of Refractive Wolf Apparel. Use promo code Anti-Hero for 15% off the best graphic tees out there. And I'm Brent Tucker, owner of FRCC. We do coffee and cigars. Use FRCC 15. You'll get 15% off the best quality coffee and cigars out there. Guarantee it. And we're going to take a second to, if you guys can, go check out our Patreon. Uh, we just, we're going to add some more stuff this week. We're going to do another drawing next episode for some free swag. And uh, won't waste too much time because we, have, we are doing a different style episode today. We're doing a hybrid where we're bringing in a remote guest. Nay, well, Brent's going to introduce him, but we're just excited that we're trying this out. Um, so bear with us. Um, we're, we're already having issues, but we're going to work through it. So, but without further ado, Brent. Yeah, I've, it is my honor to introduce Matt Kubler. Matt, we've talked several times before this. We've had great conversations. Uh, I knew from the first time that we talked that... Uh, you're going to be someone uh, I wanted to interview. You have an incredible depth of knowledge into certain subjects. You've done a massive amount of research. Um, I, let's go ahead and I'll, I'll give him your background. This will this will be a good indicator of why he does such a good job of research and gets down to the truth. Matt Kubler is a 30-year cop. Uh, he is an Army vet. He's a war veteran. Uh, he did, he was in army Intel. He was also an air marshal. He has a great background, uh, to, to be a part of this program and to dig into the topics that he's dug into. And we'll get into what those topics are in just a second. Matt, thanks so much for coming on brother. I appreciate it. I, I knew the minute I saw your, uh, when I started watching your, your Instagrams and, uh, I became a fan of what you guys were doing and the combination of military cop thing, you know, it, it, it spoke to me. Um, and then when you, you did that one piece that went viral about a mutual friend, 
that was when I kind of knew I needed to be <laughs> friends with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> we we may bring up his name later, Rob O'Neill. Um, <laughs> but what I actually want, want to talk about, um, and it was one of the many subjects we talked about that, that first night, that first conversation we were on, um, was, was Robert's Ridge and the story of, of Chapman, which if you guys don't know about it, or maybe you've heard of Robert's Ridge or you've heard of Chapman, this story was suppressed and was suppressed by the Navy SEALs, um, which what's, what should make it a bigger story. And this isn't us bashing on SEALs. It's, a, it's the same thing we do with cops. It's the same thing we'll do with the military, Army, Navy. It doesn't matter who it is. We will praise the good guys doing great work, and that is the majority of them. But every now and again, we're not scared to talk about the, the bad part about it as well. And that is, that is what this, this story is about. It's about giving Chapman his due credit, which, my gosh, does, does this guy deserve. And, um, and just kind of telling how this whole story unraveled. So, Matt, let's, let's start with uh, Operation Anaconda which is the, yeah. the beginning of this whole story and what, and what brought these guys to Roberts Ridge um, is Operation Anaconda. To give us a little bit of uh, insight into that and paint a picture for us. It was, it was pretty much the, large, the first major war offensive in the war on terror. Um, it was in the Takagar region of, of Afghanistan. I mean, you name it, there was Delta Rangers, um, Navy SEALs, 101st Airborne. There was all these units there just ready to go and, and just whoop ass on some, some terrorists. And it was the, the military believing that this, because you know, that was the ridge that that area was was the reason why the Soviets failed at taking over Afghanistan. They couldn't get past that point. So it was a very big stronghold, which is what they believed um, all the intelligence was pointing because that's where Bin Laden would be. And there was this whole, um, we've got to take that area. And that's like the main focus of of what anaconda was about it was a the thing that was very interesting about anaconda it was a great um example of how technology can fail you we were very is horror heavy very reluctant on on isr at the time and all of the human reporting was coming out saying that uh inside this valley was just an enemy you know an, an enemy haven and they would send over ISR flights, and the headquarters was pushing back, saying, "No, we're we're not seeing it," and really tried to overrule the guys on the ground. And that's really what brought the AFO elements into this operation, for them to get eyes on and really disprove the the ISR, the the imminent reporting. So yeah, it's it's it a classic was. case of it's a classic case of technology's great. But you'll never get away with uh, get it completely away from eyes on the ground. Yeah, I mean that that's sometimes technology is is the worst thing and the best thing at the same time. And <laughs> right. at that period of time too was you know it, clearly if, if twenty twenty four was when this war started, there'd be a whole different um, set of circumstances, and yeah, you know, we'd be doing reapers and all kinds of stuff that would probably be way more effective in that region than than what we had in two thousand too but um yeah it was and i mean that that just even on a smaller microcosm of that mindset is you know the mission ultimately that that created roberts ridge was a horrific mission it was probably one of the dumbest operational planning missions ever performed by the navy seals it was just there was absolutely no reason to go do what they were going to do and yet they did it and that's 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 even just add salt into the wound of the entire story of John Chapman is that it was a mission that was turned down by two other SEAL Team Six squadrons. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't until Red Team said, "Yeah, we'll do it," and it mm. was just a horrific, horrific plan. Yeah, it's it's. I actually forgot about that until you said that. I forgot that uh, the Tier One elements passed up on it. Yeah, it was. It wasn't a. I mean, there, the, it was supposed to be a lower level insertion, climb up the mountain, do their work, and come down, and they decided to land on top of the mountain. Like everything about it was bad. The time of, of day when it happened, everything about it was just a poor plan. And, uh, you know, there's a guy that 
what created that that plan is throughout and if we ever get into the full meat and potatoes of the the, the issues within the seals of corruption and the, and the brand of the seals there's one name that will always be part of it from roberts ridge on what's that name <laughs> tim Szymanski. okay the uh well we'll i will allow you to dive deeper into that uh without a problem later um if i remember right uh at when it, it's whenever something goes wrong it usually goes wrong at several levels there's never one point of failure there's usually multiple things going wrong um the helos that were supposed to insert them uh broke and it was the backup helos that ended up inserting them and the initial helos would have been armored and the heat and the backup helos that ended up inserting them much later on in the night did not ha did not have armor on them yeah it, it, i mean because of the, i mean and i guess they're and rob and i had conversations about extortion and and red wings and the fact they didn't send out package right. protection and, package with them and right yeah. there's a reoccurring theme there's there a lot of extortion. there's a lot of bad decisions. yeah yeah <clears throat> so when you think about you know tf-160 was phenomenal i mean they are just the best of the best as far as um combat helicopter pilots so um i know that they had um the best of the best flying those helicopters even though they didn't have the proper armoring on them um, yeah but it didn't but at the end of the day a pitch four plan to pitch four plan <laughs> You, you hey, can't can get I, around can I, bad plan. Can yeah. I ask a question as far as uh, Roberts Ridge? Roberts Ridge happened before Anaconda, right? It was at the it's early before. mornings of Anaconda going yeah. off. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a it was a smaller part of the big okay. operation of right. Operation Anaconda in support of. You could, uh, yeah, so for anybody that doesn't know, like people like me, can you guys break down the – not the point, but the mission purpose of what Roberts Ridge turned into and the whole incident. We talked about a little, you know, a little bit earlier and Anaconda itself. And you're right. It's, it's, it's easy to jump right into this when, when, when you know about it and we say words like Anaconda and we touch on it generally, but um, there is a Valley, uh, which, you know, like I said, we talked about a little bit was a massive amount of, of terrorist activities and, and uh, um, terrorists, camps there in this in this area and so it was going to be a very large scale operation it was gonna be the largest scale operation to date um matt are we talking 2003 2002 2002 um so it's early on in the war and the 101st really was the main element because this was a big valley clearing operation so it was called Operation Anaconda, the 101st. When you have these massive operations, it, even though Delta's there, SEAL teams are there, SEAL Team 6 are there, Green Berets are there, Rangers are there, we're a small ground element. So when you get into these much larger operations, the conventional forces yeah. are the main element. And, and so the 100... Occupy, yeah. What's that? Like, a, like an occupational, like big... Yeah, it was they were they were gonna send trucks and trucks and trucks down into into this valley and and put a massive force in there and occupy it by force. Okay, and so really the special operations teams were in support of this massive gotcha. operation, and you had a lot of the reconnaissance elements that were there in support, in uh, in location, in occupying their position before the the massive conventional forces got there okay so all these special operation teams are littering the mountaintops and going to insert on one side of the mountain uh go over the crest and then get eyes on into the valley so they could get real-time reporting of what's going on right before they get there is this size of operation pretty typical in the military or was this too big to do this was the, f as I understand it, the first of its, um, of its kind when it comes to, to, to size and scope, but we would, but we would do operations like this about every year, uh, a after this. And this is one of those bad parts about it where the next commander 
before he'd leave would want to do a massive operation that would be the bigger one, the biggest one before the last guys. Oh, imagine and that. And this was, and sometimes, and sometimes they were good, and sometimes they were just the commander wasting guys' times just so they could say they've done the largest operation in Afghanistan. That's what caused this mission that killed Neil Roberts and um, John Chapman, because Tim Szymanski was hell bent on getting Osama bin Laden. And he was convinced that he was on that mountain ridge and he was convinced that's that's what this was. He was going to make that insertion on the top of that mountain come hell or high water. There was no way he was not going to do it. And and regardless of whether it was a good plan or not. And that's kind of how the the unraveling of the entire event happened was just from that moment of, of hubris where he, he needed to have that that feeling of I'm going to be the one that gets. And he was just the he was the ops officer. At the time. He wasn't even. Um, in charge of anything yet, which he ended up being yeah. retired. As but as we all know, the the ops the opso is a very powerful person. All yeah, yeah. operations go through him, and he is more than capable of creating operations and and pushing them down. And has the ear of the commander. The opso is a very uh, powerful position, and, a and not always o- and not always occupied by our best. Right. Uh, That's very true. When it, when it comes. Now, don't get me wrong. There's plenty of good operations officers that are just going through their career progression, but it is—it's always ironic. In our case, we had one once that got fired as an ODA commander, so he wasn't good enough to run one ODA. So he gets fired from that. He goes up to battalion to be the operations officer, and now he's in charge of a battalion, which is roughly. 15 to you know 15 to 20 odas you couldn't be in charge of one but now we're going to basically put you operationally in charge of 15 of them makes no sense government work Yeah, what people don't realize is that there are, you know, in that valley, in that area where they were making their offensive was a bunch of ridges. And they had Delta inserted on one ridge and they had seals going in on another ridge. And the whole point was to create overwatch and to get eyes on, to be able to get intel, actionable intel, in order to tell guys where to go. And guys like John Chapman were on those missions, the combat controllers, because it was their responsibility to make sure that they can get the aircraft to drop bombs where they need to drop bombs. And that's kind of their entire purpose. Now, I would argue that combat controllers are some of the most badass motherfuckers there are. You know, they're 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 as special ops as any special ops. No, hold on. Last episode, we dec- we were told that SWAT guys are the most badass people on the do world. Do not start this. <laughs> I was SWAT. I, I'm not going to argue I, that. <laughs> I tried my best to squash that. Um, I will say this: on a mission like this, <clears throat> the combat controllers are the rock stars. We are basically their PSD yep. to ensure that they can get to where they need to go and that they can be on the radio calling bombs. And it's our job to protect them uh, and be their shooters. And their job, people are going to crucify me for this. Yes, their job is to be a shooter when they get until they get there. But when they get there, their job's on the radio and they... And they are a lethal force guiding in bombs that will kill way more than a gun will. Yeah. And they're the rock stars on that mission. And that's and what Chapman was. And they're, you know, talk about silent professionals. You know, there are, there are so many um, cases of special ops guys now making money off of what they did. And listen, I don't begrudge anybody for making a buck. But, you know, there is a, there is a component to the profession, um, the silent professional part of it, where... You know, while you're doing the job, you know, you go just go do the job. And those guys are, are just go do the job kind of guys. And, you know, having learned really deeply who John was um, from his sister and um, her husband, who was actually his, his supervisor, his first sergeant, um, yeah, I got to know what kind of man he was, too. And I think, you know, more importantly, um, aside from his heroics, he was a great man. Oh, we're about, we're about to find out. <laughs> 
the type of shooter and man he was really quick. So let's let's get to it. Um, let's talk about the, well. We talked. We we went back and and had to paint a bigger picture and got a little sidetracked. We're back to where this team's inserting. Their original helicopters broke. They had to get backup helicopters. Their their mission time light is pushing right. They eventually get on the birds, and they're starting to infill. Uh, I'll, I'll start. I'll paint this picture a little bit, and I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Now, the first bird, and why it's called Roberts Ridge, is there's a seal, uh, last name Roberts. His bird was inserting, and as that bird was trying to land, they came under heavy, heavy machine gun fire and RPGs. So heavy that the 160 of the pilot said, "We we can't land." It's, it'll kill everybody. No, this We're not getting out of this if I land. We're going to have to cut it short and leave. So he's about 10 feet off the deck, and he decides to, uh, to scratch the infill and to do a, either a go-around or they were going to find another infill spot. When, they, when he does that and decides to take off again, again, 10 feet off the ground, Roberts falls out of the bird um and as i read uh, actually the crew chief caught uh, grabbed him by his backpack and was holding on to him but couldn't hold on to him for very long and uh eventually dropped him gosh could you imagine being that guy um and he fell into the ground as the helicopter flew away and this is what starts the whole need for inserting people on this spot they have a Navy SEAL that fell out of a helicopter uh, due to just really bad circumstances, and now it's a rescue mission. Did they know his circumstances at that point, or did they just know he fell and that's it? He had unhooked. He prematurely unhooked. Um, so they stay hooked into the helicopter. They're, they're affixed to their seat, and he unhooked early, thinking they were about ready to land. And, and, um... and everybody has different uh, SOPs um, in a Blackhawk. You have the troop strap, and we would unhook the troop strap at one minute out. And usually what you're supposed to do is, you, you know, when you're hanging out the side of a Blackhawk, you're supposed to unhook as soon as the, the bird hits the ground. But all these guys are trying to be the first out, especially in this thing where you have heavy <clears throat> machine gun fire coming into a hot LZ. Everyone's trying to get off that bird as fast as possible to give you your best chance to fight and defend yourself and give that bird its best chance to get out of there. So people unhook early all the time. Okay. And I, I don't really have a problem with that. It's uh, it's it's part of the game. Yeah, because that bird's probably like a flying coffin, right? Oh, gosh. And it's a Chinook. Oh, I hated Chinooks. <laughs> <laughs> they're slow. They're big. They're loud. They're everything you don't want. Here we come. <laughs> That's right. They're everything you don't want as a small element inserting on the side of a mountain. But they're the only uh, they're the only bird that was going to make that you know sadly in our arsenal, um, you know the elevation that these these guys are getting dropped off at is the only one that can make that with with a payload. Yep, correct. But when you get into really high elevation, <laughs> ten thousand feet, air gets really thin, and the Chinook can make those higher climbs where a, a Blackhawk can't. So yeah, Matt's absolutely correct. Sometimes they're they're all you got if you want to ride. No one wants to walk it. <laughs> hey, Matt. So yeah. what do you know the condition of do you know what they knew of the condition of the seal when he fell when they broke contact and they had to leave him did they know if he was alive did they see him moving No there was no there was no um assessment they didn't hang out to look down or they, I mean it was a pretty decent fall it wasn't it wasn't real close to the ground it was probably by the time he had fallen out they were probably you know, 40 50 feet in the air and he he fell Oh was it that much Yeah it was there cuz they were already on the on the turn ascension um, getting out, and, and he, he can't fill out the, the door, the back door. You know, I I wonder, because I, I read the reports of when they of, of when they decided to nix it was 10 feet, mm -hmm. but obviously they're moving. I, I actually wonder if it was a detriment to them of them trying to hang on to them, and they probably gained an elevation yeah, like, while yeah. they were trying to, to pull them in. And, like, and that, the reports are, you yeah, know, there was a lot of, of reports about, his body condition and stuff after he was found. Um, 
you know, he was dead on but they're pretty much dead on impact is what was determined okay. from everything I read. Um, which again doesn't doesn't change the desire to go back and get one of your guys. Yeah. But, okay. Um, right. You know, here's, yeah. here's a question I, I have for you, Matt. We're probably going to hurt ourselves a little bit, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to paint the picture for reinsertion. When Chapman and the SEAL Team Six guys inserted, did did they already know that uh, Roberts was dead? I don't think so. The, from everything I've read and from people I've talked to, you know, everybody had their thoughts, but you know, they're not going to. I think they're going to treat it as if it's a recovery um, rescue, hoping for the best. Hoping for the best. Yeah, I don't. I think the the realities were is they were going they they were going back on that mountain anyways, um, but that just made it all all more important for them to get back there to go do that. So I don't think I don't think mission wise they were going to scrap the mission even though um, they scrapped the first attempt. I think the plan was always they were going to go back regardless of whether Neil Roberts had had fallen out or not. Okay. Now, and and this is uh, just refresh my memory on this. Were they re reinserting back where Roberts fell, or yes. was this just a, a whole separate LZ? Nope. This, exactly. This was directly same. tied into. And it's Roberts. the same guys. I mean, it, it was the same team going back in on reinsertion. So Neil Roberts was part of the red team on SEAL Team Six, and um, that was the team that ultimately ended up, you know, getting into the firefight that Chappie died. And so it was okay. the same guys going back in. Just they made another pass to try to get in. Okay. Uh, they may. I think they came in a little bit lower than than originally planned. Um, obviously. Yeah. They, go go ahead and pick it up from there. So they've they've. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it takes a, a few minutes for them to to do a, a turn a turn of burning and and get back to the LZ and try to reinsert. I, yeah. That's probably a, a, a safe bet that they probably tried to reinsert a little bit lower. Um, maybe they did. Maybe they don't. I I don't know. I don't know if you know better, but I don't know the exact, you know, if, if they asked me to look at a map, would I be able to tell you it was here versus there? No, but yeah. um, the, the realities are, is they came back in, you know, RPGs hit the, hit the helicopter, the, the helicopter pilot somehow was able to get that baby down in a, uh, a safer than, than normal crash landing. Um, and you got to remember at this point in time, it's you know, 10,000 foot elevation, whatever it is. And it's got three feet of snow. Yeah, That's right. snow covered. It's when they it's, it it, deep. When, when, oh, knee deep. Yeah, yeah. It was and, it was the worst of environments. Yeah, um, there, there was there was no uh, there was they weren't going great. <laughs> Where are the mountain guys? Like that's no. what I would have been like. This is way too like snow is just like the most because you can't see what's underneath you. you, there's, you it's unsure footing. You don't know if you're stepping in the hole or on a rock or you know it's just can't move fast. I can't imagine. Um, uh, what. Do you know roughly what time it is when Chapman and the rest of the his six, his SEAL Team Six element circle back was, around? And, and, and it was early SEAL. morning. I mean, it was probably four, three or four o'clock in the morning. I'm guessing. I'm, okay. I'm trying to remember the exact time frame. When, Still, a period when, of darkness. Yeah, but it was it it was at the tail end of it. Yeah, tail end of it because they ended up having you know the the part where John um, eventually dies. It was daylight, so it was like. 6 a.m. when when John died in that the six o'clock hour, I think when John died. Um, can you so, walk? Can you walk us through them getting off the helicopter and what uh, t turned into John taking, you know, <laughs> getting hit the first time and and yeah. then the separation of the element? Can you walk us through that? What what happened? So let's let's first paint the picture that you know there's with every one of these types of missions back then there was CIA drone footage. Um, there was a drone flying recording everything that was typical known um and and that wasn't a secret after this this cover-up the what we'll talk about later is how this actually unfolded into a holy crap they've lied about this for 15 years that's the that's the piece of the, of the puzzle that's that was missing during the 2002 time frame that they didn't know so when the when the helicopter gets hit and it crash lands <clears throat> John Chapman's the first one off the back of the helicopter. And you can see them sort of take a defensive position immediately when they get off. But John makes a beeline up towards where the gunfire. And apparently it's coming from three different sides. Again, three different um, attack points on them. And he's going towards the most direct one, which is up the hill. 
Um, and there was a, they, they called a bunker one and, and bunker two. And bunker one was the one that was directly in front of them that was shooting downhill at them. Um, that was the closest one to, to go after first. And John was the first one to head up the hill. Um, unfortunately, the, the official story that came out was that Chris Lebinski, who was the team leader, was the first one up the hill and that he was the one that hit bunker one first and killed a couple of the, the Al Qaeda force in there. Um, and he's the one that did all of these. And again, and I want to preface and I try to make sure I preface this because as a veteran, I, I respect everybody that fights for our country and that even if you lied that day, you were getting shot at, you got shot down from a helicopter, you crash landed, you exited the helicopter, you got into a gunfight with a bunch of angry motherfuckers who hate you. So you, I don't doubt anybody on that team's courage. I don't doubt their ability to fight and their willingness to fight. What I, what I have um, take umbrage with is liars. And absolutely. If, if you can't, if you can't be proud of what you did on its merit, then I have a problem with you, you lying about something you right. did not do that you stole from somebody else. So and I just want to talk about it. I want to paint, paint that picture. So. If I, if I sound very angry about what happened, it's because uh, hopefully when this is done, you'll be angry too. Um, so, so exactly. John, and the Amer any American hearing this should be angry at the person and this action. But you can separate that from SEAL Team 6, from the SEAL community. It doesn't mean they're all wrong, but this particular instance has to be talked about and has to be called into the light. Right is right. Wrong is wrong, Matt. And I, and I appreciate you telling that when most people just give them a pass and be like, oh, it was it was a tough day. It was a tough day for everyone. It was, especially for John Chapman. So and especially for John Chapman. Yeah. yeah. Um, John, John storms up, kills a couple of bad guys in the bunker. Um, at this point in time, you know, they're they're getting hit. I mean, there's PK and machine gun fire that I mean, that's that's an angry weapon, you know, that, that, that'll do some damage. Seven, seven, six, two round isn't, isn't anything to, to mess around with. And there's small arms fire. There's, there's probably AK 47 fire, but it, it's, it's a hail of bullets that they're getting hit with. Um, John, I'm not sure exactly when his first bullet wound was suffered, but it was early on as he was going up the, the mountain, um, charging that bunker. Um, they take, you know, Slobinski is probably based on, the, the way it, speed in which he was going up the mountain and the, the number of steps it took for Slobinski to, to take a spot where I was counting steps. He was probably 10 feet behind uh, John Chapman, where Slobinski was, um, going up the hill. And they both get up there. John's first. Slobinski shows up. At some point in time during this battle, after they, they take bunker number one and they're in the bunker, um, they get out and they start engaging bunker number two, which is the hill even farther. Um, at this point in time, something happens to John. They don't know exactly which, um, where, where the, 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 the round was that hit him that knocked him unconscious, but he was rendered unconscious. At this point in time, a couple other guys show up from the team up the hill. They're fighting valiantly. I'm not gonna take that from them. But Neil, Neil Roberts is down and dead. John Chapman is down and unconscious. At, at some point in time, the decision's made that this is just an untenable situation, that, that they are taking way too much fire for, for what they have available to right. them and the circumstances they're in. And they flee the area they were in down the side of the mountain to seek cover. So r real quick, Matt, I want to I wanna pick Tyler's infantry brain here and – and also paint the picture of what a crappy situation they're in. Now, within special operations, and especially this mission, their mission is really to get in on 
on scene, not get into a firefight, and make it to their position where they can call in fire. Now, obviously, this is a little bit different because they're also trying to, they're the closest element trying to recover uh, a friend's body. But do you remember the ratio that combat elements want to fight at? Three to one. Three to one. That's right. So for these guys to make this decision, it's untenable and we're out of here. 100 percent that that was the right call and 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 a little bit what brave men to take so long to make that call they could have made that they could have made that call earlier and no one would have uh i don't think would have said anything to them no and people are like yeah that, that was the right call and you know because guys you gotta remember they're even though john and 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 slavinsky and a couple of the guys moved their way up to the bunker a bunch of guys were shot and wounded really badly um, coming off the helicopter like they never even got a chance to get into the the, the fight for that so i mean they yeah. they were definitely well outside of the three to one realm uh, <laughs> as far as, uh, outmanned outgunned out surrounded out positioned dark yep, fighting have, in the snow yep. just my gosh everything you don't want in, in a night in not a night's just work. snow but three feet of snow that's insane i can't even fathom trying to move Oh, I'd, I'd imagine it took everything out of them just just moving, yeah. you know, trudging your legs in full oh, kit yeah. through that snow. So and, after they get down, pace to... that you're that you're, and at a pace where your life depends on it, <laughs> right? Gosh, yeah. When somebody's shooting at you, you're you're trying to run towards that, and the, literally, it might as well might as well have been clay or mud, right? It's like it's it's just hard to get where yeah. you're going in any type of 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 effective uh, combative manner without just praying to God, none of those bullets find you on your way up. Cause there's no zigging and zag. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you lay so they, down on it, it's not going to stop a bullet. So <laughs> no. Uh, so they make, they make the call to, to break contact. Yep. And they go down the side of the mountain. Um, at this point in time, the call is made for the AC 130 to start dropping bombs uh, on the position. The, and they know, they know Chapman is not with them, correct? They made no. a conscious. Uh, yeah, conscious they knew effort. that he was still up on up on the mountain. Yes. The so let's 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 talk about that ju just real quick and the decision they made. What what was the circumstances that they knew that they knew about John Chapman that that had them make the call to 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 go without him? What did they say? What did they say happened? Do you remember? They, I, yeah. The, yeah. The original report. Um, was that, and I guess there's some level of like a laser that they wear that would show, like it would be on if they're breathing, like it's a, I guess it's a biometrics thing that they, they can see. I didn't know uh, that. As, 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 as I understand it, if, if I remember right, it's, it's mm -hmm. been a long time that his at pale, his laser was still on his weapon and his weapon was on his chest. And they, okay. didn't, they didn't see the laser from his the weapon. The laser, yeah, there was something about the Going laser wasn't it. moving. Um, so his so laser was sure. not moving, okay. uh, you know, in, 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 in parallel with a, with a breathing pattern. Right. So that but, was, the report was the laser. They didn't see movement. Um, correct me it, if I'm wrong. Did they also say that they went to him? They said that, Bert Sabinski yeah. said he touched him. And he, he didn't. Feel a, like not a pulse, but didn't feel any movement. Didn't feel him breathing. Um, that he checked him. Yeah. Um, and and again, the, those are important facts later in the story because, um, as we're going to find out shortly, is that you know after bombs are being dropped all on that ridge line. Yeah. Um, really, 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 really close to where bunker one and bunker two were, which were pretty close together. Um, so, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something that's probably not very popular to people, but I've been in bad situations and I've, I've told my teammates this people are going to be upset that some seal team takes six guys left somebody on the mountain. And you know, that whole adage, leave no man behind. I've told my teammates this. If I am dead, leave me. If you can't recover my body, and you safely get out, do not die next to me needlessly. I didn't make it home to my family. Make it home to yours. I'm dead. Leave me. So I don't have a problem 
if their story was true, that they went up, touched them, assessed them, gave a real quick assessment. I'm not sitting here. I'm going to judge them if that's what they did. Coming under a hail of gunfire and and bash them for not doing a full body vitals check on the guy. If you went up, touched them, and gave your quick assessment and said, I can't bring him with me. And if we try to bring this 250 pound guy with us evading, we're all going to die. That, if it was the truth, I'm okay with. I am. And it's going to upset some people. No, everybody dies. Leave no man behind. That's just not the truth. And I, I understand the, the, the mindset for your brotherhood, that that's what you would, you really want to be there for them to make sure that, you know, everybody gets their, 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 their family to see them last one last time. I get all that. And you're right. It's, I wouldn't, I would not want anybody dying trying to save my fat ass. Um, that's for damn sure. And I, I, I don't have any, if the story was the story, I'm okay with the entire story. Yeah. I get it. It all makes sense to me. If, if, even, even, I'll preface it, I'm not okay with taking John's glory and, and his, what he's rightfully did. I don't like anybody stealing that part. But the, all the other stuff, all, if everything else was the way that it was, then I'm okay with all of that. None of that matters. And again, what you did that day as a fucking hero should be enough. It should be enough. There shouldn't need right. to be any other explanation other than, we fought our asses off that day, and this is how it went out. It's just right. what, the way it was, and that that should be enough. If the if the story, the initial report was true, zero issues with anything they did, nothing but bravery happened. They were given a shit sandwich, and they did the best they could with what they had and acted like men. The problem comes is we find out. Years later, the initial report wasn't the truth. So how well, I mean, long? Let's let's let, let's let's finish up John's heroism. I mean, we got to make sure that the after he comes to, yeah, John okay. is up on that mountain. He's unconscious, and an hour later, for whatever reason, he wakes the fuck up. <laughs> it's crazy. It's and absolutely not only, crazy. Not only that, he starts engaging the enemy again. And he's going, and he's going at, and he's shooting in every direction because the ta the the uh, QRF is coming in, the the Rangers are coming in to try to rescue the seals to get them off the mountain. Well, they crash land, um, and a bunch of guys. There was twenty three on that bird, I think, and eighteen lived, and that's because of of John Chapman redirecting fire at himself away from the QRF as if you know they're they're deplaning the the bird. He's getting shot at more and more. And when it's when it's all said and done, he he ends up going hand to hand combat. That's right, with a guy, and then ultimately dies from a wound that he had suffered, you know, thirty minutes before, a chest wound that he ends up dying from. But I think he ended up with nine bullet holes. Um, let me see if I can find that. I mean, it's it's a shit ton. Whatever it is, he had like sixteen different wounds between shrapnel. Um, hand to hand combat wounds and and bullet wounds. Amazing. And and he he ultimately succumbs to 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 one of the bullet wounds that that he got through the heart. Wow. Um, and eighteen soldiers survived that day, and because of of his actions. And and he's people don't know this. He was actually qualified for two Congressional Medal of Honors um, because they broke it into two different segments the first segment before he went unconscious second segment when he um came to and fought again so you only got one um but we'll talk about that in a second um so the the part i mentioned earlier about the the, the cia drone footage so when you think about what that is it's basically just a a bunch of black dots moving around that it's it's able to capture on some level what happened and it was the first Ultimately, it was the first Medal of Honor um, battle ever captured on film. Yeah, ever recorded. Yeah, um, did but it's did hard. The but, did the did the military know that this? Was yeah, everybody knew that that existed. But but the thing is, is that there's no way to know who's who. Okay. 
So you didn't know who got off the, the back of the, uh, the bird first and who went up and did what. There was no way to say that's the black blob there is John and that black blob there is, is Slavinsky. It was just a bunch of little ants running around um, doing stuff. And so it was really hard to tell who's who. So for you know the next 15 years, 14, almost 15 years, um, the story was what the story was, that Bruce Lubinsky was a hero that day and he stormed a bunker and killed a couple Al-Qaeda fighters and went engaged more and killed more. And um, John was went up the mountain too with him and you know, just a secondary character to the, the entire event. And uh, you know, he was the, the Robin to Batman. And, yeah. um, you know, they both were uh, awarded <clears throat> the highest uh, award within the Air Force and the Navy um for their for their heroism and at, at the at the time that was yeah that was great that's what you did and god bless you and, and john was actually he's the only non-navy seal in their wall of fame at the seals he's the only one and they did that in 2002 right after the, the event that. they put him up on the wall of fame so when you think about <clears throat> it and i'm not trying to i am okay i'm not gonna, i am saying that it's they created a a narrative and concocted a well-devised plan that they were able to maintain under the cover of ignorance for 15 years because no one asked any questions. Well, John yes Fett. and no. Matt, here, here's a question uh, that I have for you. Mm -hmm. But we it's hard to tell who's who, and, and that is true. I, 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 you can go to YouTube and see the video. It's a grainy video. It, it is hard to tell. And of course, on the YouTube video, it'll tell you who, who's yeah. who um, as an afterthought, you know, that, that they did afterwards. But that ISR video stayed, that, uh, that ISR platform stayed on scene to monitor the body. Mm -hmm. And they knew then that he got up. And they knew then that he was fighting in that bunker. So why did it take so long for the truth to come out that he did not die there, that he got up and continued to fight? That was it's funny how you known. say that. Yes. Well, it is. Well, it was known to them. It was not known to the public and Who's to them to the Navy. Okay. The Navy. So the, the explanation that was given later during the, uh, because no one asked any questions. So three, and it's, it's funny. So when you think about, <clears throat> How you get an award right you have to be written up by somebody somebody has to there has to be witnesses to stuff and somebody to put their john hancock and say yeah i watched him do this that and the third for john's uh i'm gonna say the flying cross or whatever the air force's top award is i think that's what it's called um he was awarded based on three witness statements three seals who um said what he did on the mountain that day their version of what he did on the mountain that day and they never signed their their statements but then the air force didn't really care about that because they were emailed in the, the statements were electronically signed or electronically sent okay. um through email so they they processed the the award based on those three unsigned statements so <clears throat> the navy's the navy seals and the navy's defense of why they believe in and we're, we're kind of getting ahead but it's 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 fine to go ahead to this point because it's a great question you don't know who the black bobs are you don't know if that was an al-qaeda fighter you don't know if that was a, a navy a navy seal because they were enemy combatants in that same general area okay the argument that the navy said when they were trying to block john chapman's uh congressional medal of honor package was that um he didn't wake up and fight valiantly that those blobs were al-qaeda fighting each other and they didn't know they were fighting each other because at the time they didn't have the the sigint component of this okay that was able to identify that the marrying of the the, the isr feed and the sigint component where they married the the radio frequencies and and uh, of who was doing what they were able to, to marry the two the, the isr feed and the electronic stuff that they were able to capture from the seals and figure out who was doing what um and that's that's how this whole thing got blown open was that technology someone whoever god bless them 
whoever at NSA or wherever they were at that that said let's let's see what who they were for no other reason maybe just for shits and giggles but they uncovered one of the biggest cover-ups in in our military's history because it it isn't like <clears throat> one guy shot another guy in a room and nobody someone else take credit for it this is a congressional medal of honor potential so this is there's not many of those given out this is the baddest ass of the baddest right this is top of the top and to be able to uncover a lie of this magnitude that lasted for you know a decade and a half is gigantic so so, so as far as you know the, it wasn't someone within the navy and then the navy corrected this wrong they were forced to correct this wrong from from the outside and, I, and I'm gonna, would it be yours would it be your interpretation or correct to say that not only did they not uncover it and right the wrong they they fought it Oh, they, 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 all the way to the end, like in, in a, in a joint, like the, the commander of SEAL Team 6, the guy by the name of Jeremy Williams at the time, um, in 2015, 16, he publicly fought with the Secretary of the Air Force and the Secretary of Defense to block John Chapman's Congressional Medal of Honor. So much so that they came out with a video, they created a video that basically, um, made John Chapman irrelevant. Like they, they created like a propaganda video of what happened that day and to, to, to propel Brit Slavinsky's version yeah. to quash John Chapman's well, version. And, uh, can I, and another thing too is you said back in 2002 when this happened that they, the, the Navy gave John all the, they put him on the wall of heroes, right? Absolutely. And they gave him and they acknowledged his bravery. But I started realizing that when we investigated another seal or we talked about another seal that that's the best way to deflect anybody looking at you is to talk about someone's bravery and you're like wow yeah 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 and so have you noticed that that's like, if, like for instance it's right now if i if i was it to started go, with robert's rich it was yeah, the original if, I was, if i was to go but this sounds really terrible but if i was to murder brent right now oh, and no. i was gonna and I was going to cover it up. The first thing I tell everybody is how brave Brent was. And he tried to kill the invader that was killing us. And Brent took the round. And then the invader left. And Brent's a hero. Because I'm trying to cover up my murder. But, yeah, it's, it's what they, I mean, and we're going to go into a major rabbit hole in a second. But we'll try not to. But that is, if you think about, if you just to go 35,000 foot view it and look at the Navy SEALs and, and think about the war on terror and how the Navy SEALs have monopolized the money verticals. If you look at books, if you look at movies, if you look at uh, all of them, they are all Navy SEALs, you know, 13 hours, um, What's the one with uh, Zero Dark Thirty, uh, Lone Survivor, American Sniper. And we'll get, if you want, down the road, we can have shows about all of those. I can have conversations about every single one of them and how they aren't what they seem. Mm -hmm. And there is a pattern that exists. And as an Intel analyst who, you know, my job was crypt analyst and that's what I did every day. And as a cop, that's what we do. We look at patterns. We try to figure out where are we seeing the most crime happening? What is the... We're looking at drug trafficking. Who are the players? What are their their patterns and where do they stand typically? And what are their where do they keep the drugs at? What are their handshakes? How are their body language? Like all of this is is relevant because if you watch what the Navy SEALs have done for the last 20 years since Roberts Ridge, is they've taken a blueprint on how to, to not have to tell the truth and how to disguise the truth by by creating heroes. Because and, and you gotta remember, this is right after 9-11. So People are still fucking angry at Taliban and at Al Qaeda and at you know Muslims in general. <clears throat> so I still it like wasn't it. hard to create a hero. <laughs> so I like him. It's like um, it's not hard to create heroes in a time period where people are dying for heroes. Yeah. So they they saw an opportunity to um, to do that, and you know after everything is over with this mission and the stories are being cultivated you know john gets his wall of fame at the seals he gets the his medal from three seals who 
um, sent in their, their, their witness statements to verify that he deserved this medal. But when it came time for the Congressional Medal of Honor stuff, when the Air Force, um, Secretary of the Air Force decided that they wanted to start looking at um, past airmen who have ever done anything potentially that might be worthy of of a Congressional Honor, a Medal of Honor, they, they created like a little task force to look into other other instances and stuff like that. And Johns was the only one that met the criteria. So they put a package together and they first thing they do is they call the three SEALs that wrote their statements and ask them if they would just sign them. And they refused. Mm. No way. They refused to sign his, the statements. And, and if you think about that, that is... There, there's, and again, the question is always why? Why wouldn't you sign it? You're already on record. Because you're lying. They wouldn't sign it because they knew where this was heading. They knew that this was for a, um, you know, instead of an Air Force Cross, he was going for a Congressional Medal of Honor. And, that, and the Navy wouldn't allow that to happen. They wouldn't allow that, that to happen, at least not just John. So yeah. what does the Navy do? They spin up their package for Chris Lubinsky to get the Medal of Honor. And initially, oddly enough, that was actually denied. His was denied. They, uh, it's amazing how when you read the, the, the details of, of the, the last part of this, this corrupt story on how not only did Brit Slabinski steal John Chapman's glory for 15 years, but then how the Navy and Navy SEALs and SEAL Team 6 specifically did everything in their power to make sure John Chapman did not get the credit he deserved. That is, I mean, and we're talking, this is 2016 now when this was going on. 2017 um, is when he was awarded. And I think it was in August. It was supposed to be under Obama's um, term because of the, by the time they had it in. Because if it goes from one presidential administration to another, they got to start the process over again. So it's, yeah. it's not like it just continues on and it gets picked up and the next president mm. does the award. It's, it's a full on redo. Um, now, to, to stop you there, because it's it's in the, the time frame of that 2016. I remember being in the unit and having two, four guys, you know, the rumor mill start coming about like, hey, one of our guys is in for a Medal of Honor and them telling the story of of Roberts Ridge and what what was told and then what really happened. And they were there was some damage scroll to be to, to be done and, and rightfully so. The two four guys were very upset about it. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I have to, I, I have to st st step back and say this. And, and we said it before, and I'll say it for you, Matt, because I've talked to you enough. This is a problem within, within a few that makes a, a whole bunch of people look bad. SEAL Team 6 are great dudes. Great dudes. They've done amazing things. It is unfortunate that a couple people have come to the forefront to really ruin their reputation. And I wish more would stand up to, to right these wrongs. And they won't though. And, that, and, and that's, I think when you think about it, and again, I'm, I'm not an op, a, a tier one operator. I'm not a Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 6, dead crew guy. I'm not anything remotely close to that. I know, you know, the thin blue line is a cop and, you know, they can say that that's, Maybe back when I first started, that was a thing. Today, it's it's nothing. Um, everybody's out to get theirs. But I can, I know I understand in theory the close ranks and keep things in house mindset, and that you know, trust me, they'll talk shit about each other. They're, they have no problem talking about each other, just not on the record. They won't go and talk to anybody with any level of of ability to share that information officially. Well, it, uh, it puts them in a bind as well. Uh, I, 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 can, I can press them and say, yes, I wish you would stand up and, and say more. But then again, we're also hoping and begging and wanting for those quiet professionals. And they're being quiet professionals. They're, they're out there, not saying, but they're, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So if you're a loudmouth Navy SEAL that writes books and movies and 
and gets out there in the meeting saying stuff, you're a loudmouth Navy SEAL. But if you're the quiet professional that just does your job and doesn't want to talk about it, now you're not standing up for the right thing. And I will say that is a predicament. And it, it, it's not, it's, it's not a, a point that, that I would want to be in, to be honest with you. I do, I, I do have some sympathy for that. I, again, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I, here's where the, the issue lies with me. There is a, I'm able to separate war from crime, right? I understand that, that there is some nasty, dirty shit that happens in war. And I understand sometimes the line gets a little blurred and sometimes there's casualties that weren't meant to happen. I get all of that and I have no issues with any of that. What happens is that internally is that they're very good at manipulating, especially the younger guys, the newer guys within, and not necessarily just SEAL Team 6, but all the teams and um, within the Navy SEALs. They're good at manipulating the young guys that are, are, are working hard and doing exactly what they're ordered to do and going out on the missions they're ordered to do and uh, executing the missions in the fashion which they're ordered to do. And sometimes those lines get crossed and the powers that be use that line being crossed as leverage. And when it's time for someone to shut the fuck up, that's the leverage. Or when it's time for somebody to do something criminal, that's the leverage. And a lot of the guys that, that join, at least now, are, are kids that are not necessarily the, the, the Navy, um, Naval Academy grads. These are kids that, that have maybe some anger issues, <laughs> we're, we're outstanding athletes, but maybe tend to get in some trouble. Um, and that's, that's what we want. And they're not, re- yeah, they're not recruiting choir boys. Right. So choir getting, boys don't, get, don't go kill people in the middle of the night with e-tools. Right. And that's, and that's the, 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 the quandary you find yourself in. If you are, if, if everybody is working off the same playbook, right? If everybody's going, um, we're just some pipe hitting motherfuckers. Our job is to go out and do bad things to bad people. And that's just our job. And we have to come right with Jesus on our own and, and figure it out. And, and we have the support of our team and we make it through together and we support one another. And then we just go out and continually do that until our career is done. And then we go to therapy for the rest of our lives and drink ourselves to death. If that's the process and everybody's working up the same game plan, then I'm, I get it. It all makes sense to me. It's right. when within the, the, the teams themselves, when, when you realize that the cover up of Roberts Ridge created a pattern by which criminal activity occurs and cover ups result from that, that you start to realize the pattern is, is that there are people in power who are willing to manipulate the playbook that they know everybody, my brother, my brother, my brother, I will do anything for my brother. When they know that that is the mindset and they will get them to do anything to maintain their place in that brotherhood. So people are going to say this and I'll give you, I'll, we'll get ahead of the comments. And give mm-hmm. you give you a chance to uh, give them an answer. When you say things like this is a problem moving forward, and it's a it's a culture issue, and it, and it happens happens time and time again, off of this in, off of this incident, and then they're going to go. For instance, what what's what happened after Roberts Ridge? What are these things you're referring to that are cultural problems within the seals that are happening over and over again? Name them. Well, there was, I mean, there was one literally like days later where they thought they had been lied in a convoy and Red Team goes back out again and Rich Lubinsky goes out again and um, they have the helicopters and Blackhawks and they take out this entire convoy. And then, you know, there's reports that there was some overkilling, meaning some um, unnecessary rounds put into a human being for nothing other than the shooter's enjoyment. Um, but there was a wedding party. <laughs> it wasn't a single terrorist in that group. Wow. And that was good enough. I didn't wasn't, that. Yeah, there that's wasn't, referred to as the wedding party. Yeah. Yeah. So there, I mean, it was, and, and you could argue that they were just so wound the fuck up from what happened there that 
you know, they had to blow off some steam. Well, I, again, I'm, I don't have a problem with war. I don't, I don't even necessarily, not, and this is just me, this isn't, I don't necessarily have a problem with anything that happened on that event. My problem is, why'd you have to cover it up? Is the cover up. Why what? does it have to be a cover up? Why can't, and again, no one is going to be like, hey, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't put those extra rounds into the guy and watch him bounce every time you round hit him and watch his body twitch and then get amusement out of that. That's kind of fucked up, but we'll handle that in house. That's not going to come out in the press release. I mean, it's nor should the cover it. up. The, the cover up is this is, you know, wasn't a wedding party. Yeah. I mean, it came out later, but you know, those, those are the, and, and they, they hadn't yet perfected the cover up. You know, there's, there is, um, there's what happened after of, the wedding party. What else? Well, what else you got? Because then they're going to say, "Well, you're saying it's a it's a culture and it's happening over and over again," and you named one. Yeah, then you know, obviously, in 2004 is when uh, you know Bessonet and and Ro arrive, Rob O'Neill arrive at at um, Red Team, and then 2005 is Red Wings, right? So Red Wings was the the Mark Luttrell, um Lone Survivor movie. Oh. I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll talk yeah. a little bit uh, about some circumstances around Red Wings. And after I did the Rob O'Neill interview, there's a lot of people that asked me to do the same type of, you know, podcast specifically on that and the inconsistencies with those stories. And to be honest with you, everybody knows it. It's different than the Rob O'Neill thing because because good guys died that day, and I'm not going to talk ill of the dead. Um, Marcus Luttrell has to live with his story, and I'll just and I'll just leave it at that. So everyone hoping for that two hour podcast on Red Wings, you, you're not going to get it. But if you don't have to dig far to to find out what happened that day, I mean that was the the big thing on that day is not only obviously. You know, they went up without TF-160. They went with no package. It was a, you know, they say it was a short flight. There was no need, whatever, whatever the excuse was why you ran 30 people into a, a Chinook um, because they said we have a better shot, you know, at survival if we all go in one helicopter versus two. Um, again, operationally, I don't understand those decisions. Um, it's a bad op, in my opinion. You know, Rob and a guy named Reed were, were on the helicopter. They were supposed to be on that helicopter. They got pulled off. Rob didn't answer why. He, he admitted he was, but he didn't answer the why, um, why he was pulled off um, that mission. Um, but that was hit with a SA-7 and not an RPG, as, as the Navy reported. Um, what's the difference? Know, that changed. Uh, an RPG is just a well, basically yeah, what's a, the What's the first? An SA-7 and is an actual air defense system and ever okay. since missile rather than just an unguided rpg yeah. you know obviously rock repel grenade going there it's it's a serious thing especially intel wise to know there's sa7s in the area and we knew there were sa7s operational early in the war and we were trying our hardest to, to round them all up and get them and the cia paid buku bucks for any that they could get their hands on um if i remember right the tier one guys turned that mission down because of the SA seven. Um, so they knew they were out there. Yeah. They knew, they knew they were out there before the mission. Is that as, as you understand it as well, Matt? Yes. Not yeah. that's the reason why the cover up of what shot down the helicopter, you know, that that's a, that's a whole different game than, than some random lucky shot from an RPG from some you know, camel jockey. Right. So that's a whole different conversation. And then that goes into operational planning, that goes into intelligence and, and listening to um, the intel and then having the proper package for the potential that existed and not putting everybody into one helicopter. And, you know, was there, you know, that I'm not, I'm not even, I'm, I'm, it's hard because I, I enjoy a good conspiracy theory, but it's, you know, why would people be pulled off that helicopter? Why would they be sent out with, why would all of those things happen all at the same time without yeah, it potentially having some level of corruption behind it? Why, wait, so why were people pulled off? I'm robbing that's the question. Pulled off the yeah, no one knows? He said Rob, Rob didn't answer it. I, 
I, I have. We'll talk after this. I, I have my suspicions, but I don't, I don't like to get deep into uh, you know the, the conspiracy no, theories exactly. of, uh, of certain things. We should probably have a a, a, a conspiracy theory alone episode because that's be and, and have it wrapped up and 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 that. But for me, as an investigator, I have to I have to because of the work I'm doing for my buddy's death is I have to make sure I keep everything I do fact based. Right. Um, and, well, and I'm trying my very best to, to not get sucked down rabbit holes, but it's fun so you, to go down them. So you have Operation Red Wings. Yeah. Is there anything any more you want to add to that list? Um, oh, yeah. Well, there's, there's plenty. I mean, the, the whole, um, you know, there was, there was a report um, with Captain Phillips that, that raid, uh, the, the, the rescue mission of Captain Phillips. They made a movie. I forgot that movie, too. Um, Rob was on that, that mission as well, where they, you know, killed the Somali pirates and um, but there was a report that there was $30,000 missing off the boat um, that nobody can account for. Mm. And, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know if anybody stole $30,000. I'm just telling that there is, there are statements that there was an investigation into and that, that's, this is the fact there was an investigation into missing $30,000. So was, I have a question like um, when these types of conflicting reports come out that give the ability or to, to shed light on an investigation are these other seals that are trying to do the right thing by staying anonymous and saying like hey here's something to look at or how that how's this stuff coming out so i get and, and this is probably a good time to jump into this and i'm sure this wasn't how we envision our show going but here we are um i was brought in to investigate my buddy's uh, high school buddy of mine's death he was the commander of seal team four he was found dead in his bunk on December 22nd, 2012 in, uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah. And you're speaking um, of, of, of Joe Price, Joe Price, yeah. a, uh, SEAL, single team, gun com- a SEAL team commander that allegedly committed suicide in, in, in theater, a SEAL team commander. That's big. And news. It, it made, there was a literally the only news coverage, the only television news coverage was a, like a ticker tape at the bottom of the screen on CNN. Um, and then there was nothing. There was no what happened to Joe Price follow up. There was a couple stories that were written, one in the New York Times, which was kind of a fluff, uh, sad Joe killed himself piece, which um, didn't really help the family at all. Um, yeah. So I was brought in to investigate that because they had um, been brought into some information that he potentially did not kill himself. Absolutely. And we all kind of had our, our gut feeling that he did. So. Uh, and I won't get real deep into that, but from that investigation, from speaking to people uh, about what happened that day, I was then brought in on other events that had occurred because I was doing such a good job on Job that my, my one main contact within the SEALs started asking me about other things, to look at other things. And, and through that came more interviews and more contacts and more speaking to people. And, right. and the uh, domino effect happened off, off, off yeah, of Yeah, next thing you know, I've, I've got... Yeah, you know, 50 tentacles and 50 cookie jars and um, not necessarily what I wanted to be doing, but, you know, I'm, a, I'm an investigator and just like anybody else that's ever investigated, you, once you get your teeth into something, you don't want to let it go until you solve it. Yeah. So for me, I wanted to, to first and foremost, make sure that whatever I'm doing, even your show here, ultimately my goal is to create awareness of a overlying problem within the Navy SEALs so that I can create enough discomfort for the people who are creating these problems within the seals so that they give me what I want, which is Job's killer. I love it. Or, that, that's, or, that's, all of, or all of the evidence to his crime scene, because I don't have. Yeah. I've, of I, I've started. There are some articles. Um, like I said, it's, it's not much, but if, if, if you look into it, you can see at least the, the narrative, the official narrative that's, that's put out and surrounding Job's death. And I'd love to have you on, and we'll have you on again just to talk about that one because obviously you spent a lot of time into that one. It's personal to you. I will give you an opportunity to to dig deep into that uh, at a future episode. Um, with you having all these, we'll call it like tentacles now and hands in the cookie jar. You may or may not know we did an episode about Rob O'Neill. Are you, are you aware of it? I can't call it. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> I, I catch a lot of flack from the few Rob O'Neill believers that, that are somehow still out there. Af, after for two hours, I showed you how it's just factually 
not possible. And then I get I get told, and it's it's his corner. He always comes back into. Well, you weren't there. I was I was the only one there. Very convenient. Has that subject ever come up as well with with all your contacts? And what do they say? Yeah, um, it, and it, again, it wasn't even on my radar at first, and it wasn't until um, I got brought into Job's thing, and 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 there are. Again, I talked about Tim Szymanski, who was the ops officer for Roberts Ridge. Tim Szymanski has elevated himself from ops officer to commander SEAL Team 6 to uh, head of Naval Special Warfare to uh, head of you know, number two guy, JSOC. So he's he's a guy that and got promoted to, I think, Rear Admiral was where, when he retired. He is a, a constant in every one of these cover-ups. His, his stamp is on this. He was in charge on, at some level in most of these. And, and these aren't all SEAL Team 6 cover-ups. These are, some of them are, some of them aren't. There are, there are plenty. I mean, Melgar, um, one of your a Special Forces guy was killed in Mali. That's right, um, in Africa. Two SEALs and a Marine. Um, that's because, a crazy story. That's a crazy story. And I think that's when you realize, when we had our conversation, our first conversation, you weren't 100% sold on the whole conspiracy connection of 20 years of, of corruption. Yours was more, you know, Rob O'Neill is a liar and, and he didn't kill bin Laden. And I'm like, well, it's bigger than that. And, you know, when you connect the dots and you see the patterns, then it all makes sense. It's not a matter of, and I, I said it, uh, I did three shows with Rob O'Neill um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but what I realized was, is that Jocko, Marcus, Chris Kyle, when he was alive, um, Mark Slotrell I'm talking about, um, Rob O'Neill, these guys, in and on their own are not telling the truth about certain things that they said they did. But they put them out there, this, the Navy SEAL brand, the brand is to create, and we talked about this when you said, what if you killed Brent, is you create the distraction so that everybody's looking at what what they believe is the true picture of what's going on, which is the, you know, you look at Jocko Wellnick, he was Task Force Bruiser with Chris Kyle, and Chris Kyle was out there you know, destroying targets some maybe not legitimate um you know and and you'll you'll probably be able to justify that or, or confirm this you know everybody every unit gets gets graded on a deployment and your team your when you were delta you probably got graded on every one of their deployments and if you wanted to go back out on a primo op if you had a real shitty prior deployment you probably weren't going to get that one so seal teams when they were you know in country and, and fighting a 20-year war they were getting graded on their, their ops. And, um, you know, Jocko had gotten a real bad review on one of his, on one of his deployments. And when they got back out and they were a task force bruiser, he was damn sure not going to allow that to happen again. So they unleashed Chris Kyle and Chris Kyle did what he did and got notoriety for it. Um, came back, they made a movie about him, he wrote a book, his wife's everywhere. He's all, they're all big into the Navy SEAL foundation. Um, and then he dies somehow, oddly enough, at the hand of some no skilled Marine on a range somehow. I'm not buying that. And we can have, that's another conversation for later. Ooh, that's a, yeah, can you, you have, do you have for that later conversation? So that's how I mean, that's how, that's the official. Yeah. Do you have story. anything though that would contradict that or no, nothing yet? I'm, I'm some, yeah. Um, not enough, not enough to put together a, yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a backed thesis, but tangentially, yes. Um, but then all of a sudden from that, from his death comes Jocko Wilnick and Lee Fabin and, you know, they're echelon front and podcasts. And, you know, you look at Jocko and he's, he looks the part, <laughs> looks Good. like a badass war pipe hitting killer. S- says all um, the right things. That's for sure. You know, and I, well, I try to depends well, on who you are, <laughs> but, but his, but his, you know, his tenants of right. leadership are no different than what, you know, some CEO of an, of a tech company is telling his people. It's not, right. he's just the delivery mechanism. I always say this. I, I love when people regurgitate common sense or things that have been around for a hundred years and people are like, wow. And it's just because the way you look and the way you say it, but you gotta, gotta, you gotta say it like this, you gotta say it like that, man. <laughs> and you gotta have rock music in the background. Good. 
when you say it. But but that's but that's the that's the distraction. So but, they create these images of heroic figures and they use them to distract you from believing that there could ever be two Navy SEALs that kill a, a special forces guy in Mali and they say it was just roughhousing and somehow he's got major injuries and uh, dies. Well, Matt, um, I got or, I got to bring you back to, to my original, maybe you're getting to it, but my original question was what, do your Navy SEAL contacts say about the Rob O'Neill mission about and that's his, kind of about his narrative, that. yeah, Matt Bissonnette's version? Yeah. So the, the, the cover up and Rob was you know, early, he was midstream of, of the, the war, right? He's midpoint, you know, 2011 um, when the UBL rate was. So, but he had been with the teams and, and been part of other cover ups, maybe not directly involved, but his, his team uh, on SEAL Team 6 was. Um, so through my investigations and all these things, which again, came with a lot of, uh, contacts created and the contacts that I've spoken to, um, not one, not a single one says that Rob O'Neill killed Bin Laden. Will, um, they, will they come out publicly and say it? No. And why, Never. and why won't they? Because the, well, there's, there's probably multiple layers to that question number one i would i think there is still even even though he's png um for the that he's persona non grata he's not allowed back at command um he is not a respected internally anymore with with the teams um i think the the brotherhood part still exists because they don't want to be the one that breaks the silence and that's fair. they themselves are ostracized. That's number one. Number two, I believe there's pressure from the top. And I talked earlier about, you know, sometimes these guys have to do things in war that then in any other time, if everybody's on the same playbook, it's just business as usual. But when you have the ability and we learned it through the last you know, five to seven years that they can just change terms. The, the government, the deep state, the government, they can, they can say a hero is a bagger of groceries during COVID. They can, you know, they can, they can make you a terrorist because you showed up at the Capitol on January 6th. Like they can make anything be what they want it to be. And, and, and if you just look at it from what we're seeing in our world today and just bring it down to a smaller, more uh, intricate level with the Navy SEALs. It's the same patterns. Everything is the same. And they're all using the same playbook. And I believe they're all interconnected in their intention from the top down, from the, the government down into the Navy SEAL community itself. But I think the, the fear of losing the brotherhood and then also going to jail for the rest of their lives well, I'll, for something that they did in war. And, and your contacts may you may be getting the same feedback from them, but not to not to tease everyone with this because it's at the end of the day it's it's on them. But I can tell you, the guys on that mission that reached out to me after that podcast and said, "Good job, so glad you did that," and I said, "Thank you." I would appreciate it if if you also you know stood up and said it beside me. And at first they're like, "No, nah, you you know why I can't do that? I can't do that." I've made I've I've kept up with those guys and more of them are starting to say I might it's we're we're really getting tired of him he's he said too much for too long um I'm I'm considering it and so I I do maybe I'm just optimistic about it I think there will be a huge break in this story I'm hoping this year that they will finally well, have grown too, so tired of it they're willing to say something about it I think the break only comes if they can do it in force. I don't think there's going to be one guy on an island doing it. And and again, I never, at no point in time did, and I told you, you know, a year ago, I trolled Rob on, on Jeremy Sladen's uh, Instagram page, uh, the J Slay USA podcast, which is where we did the interviews with Rob. Uh, by the way, yeah. you pressed him that, that first episode with him. You pressed him harder than anyone has ever pressed him just on the first one. And he couldn't have looked any more uncomfortable 
having to ask questions uh, that he's never had to answer, that Sean Ryan's not going to ask him. You can go down the list. No one, the BBC, whoever else, softball interview is going to ask him things like, then who shot them all, Rob? Then if Red took shots and you said he took shots, who'd he hit? Like all sorts of, of questions that you pre- that you pressed him on that he's never had to answer because everyone's just took in his story at face value. He was very uncomfortable in that interview. Thank you so much for asking him hard questions. Well, it was the only way that I knew how to do it because at the end of the day, I don't want to be his friend. I, I, not that it, I'm not a nice person, but I had no need to have Rob O'Neill as my friend. But um, my goal with that, when I thought we were having one interview, was to just get him worried enough that the information that I have comes out. And, you know, I, I shared it on the show. I shared it with you. I know Reza's name. I know the command master chief's name that recorded the debrief at the end. I know their names. And, and my goal is not to out names. I don't want to, I'm not that guy. That's not my job is not to do that. But as I said earlier, if it gets to the point where I'm not getting any more momentum, and I'm not able to get on any more shows and share whatever information I have, and it's not reaching the desired place, and I'm not getting the, the enough rattling of the cages, I'll release names if, it, if that's what it takes to get Job's killer. Cutthroat, baby. I love it. So Man, I, I, but I will hold on to that until the very end. I respect But that. I want to make sure that that is very A last-ditch effort. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I, don't, I don't want to ruin Reds' anonymity. I don't. Well, and the way um, you look at it is there's an innocent man that's was possibly murdered. And if if medial details like people's names on missions need to come out to get you the information you need to solve it, then so be it. Right. And it's it's a simple solution. It's not I'm not asking I'm not asking for and I told and I I will vow to this day and I said it on Jeremy's show, I will go away. Everything I have, I'll try an NDAs with the Navy, I'll say nothing anymore. Because I, at the end of the day, that's the only horse I have in the race. Right. Is well, Joe. well, we'll we'll tell you this, Matt. You 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 said, and if I never get another podcast, can people stop <laughs> stop talking to me? You'll always have this podcast, you know, to to do the right thing on. It's 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 why we do it. It's to do the right thing, and they may not, yeah, like how it's done uh, all the time, but hey, at the end of the day, everyone's had their opportunity to do the right thing. And we're telling everyone now, you have the opportunity to do the right thing. Yeah. So I, the hardest the, thing is that there are, there are guys that have done great things. Like I told Rob, 98.5% of the stuff, I don't know anything else other than you run the, the raid with, with Captain Phillips that went a little bit sideways with some money that I don't know if that was the was thrown overboard by the pirates right. or You're Right. Or it whatever. may have nothing to do with them. No. It right. may have nothing to do with them. And, and then you have Bin Laden. Other than that, he said he had 400 combat missions, 398 and a half of the other ones. Thank you. God bless you. You're a hero. And and I'm not Absolutely. questioning his integrity to fight for our country. That's not what this is about. You you There is a jump the shark moment in all of the things that I'm investigating where it goes from being an American hero fought today to some criminal shit just happened. And, and there is, I mean, I can go super, super, super dark with with drugs and money and um, Eastern Port of Maryland being used as a shipping drop off for drugs. Like there's all kinds of shit happening that's involving the Navy SEALs. I want everyone to know right now, I am not suicidal. And neither am I. And I'm not going to shoot Brent. (laughs) (laughs) But But again, all of this comes down to one case that I care about. The rest of it, I am not. I am not interested in going down any more of these rabbit holes with these investors. I'm not, but I have to because I made a promise, and it's the only way. I've done everything I possibly can to get people to care about Joe, well, and I, nobody does. Well, we do, and we are going to have you back to talk just uh, about Job because uh, he deserves it. He's a warrior. His family deserves it. His legacy deserves it, and we will 100% have you back for that and um any of these other rabbit trails that that come off of it i want to make this for Lori chapman um who is john's sister she wrote the book alone at dawn if you have not read it it is a phenomenal book 
Um, it's literally the truth about what happened that day. Um, you know, Brits Lebinsky, for all of the, the, the maybe good things he's done in his career, this is unexcusable and unforgivable, stealing someone else's glory and, and something they did in service of their nation at the highest level. And to anybody who would call, you know, Rob called him a stud. He's not a fucking stud. He's a thief. And when you steal someone else's story and propagate it as your own for your own benefit and your own mental, um, make yourself feel good or because you're told to by the, by the Navy, I don't give a shit why, if you don't have the balls to stand up and do the right thing, then, then I don't have any respect for you. So well, out of well, you can Rory, understand I, how, I would say that and I'm doing that for her tonight. Well, you can understand how Rob wouldn't have a problem with that. Yeah. You, and, just, and again, you I, just described Rob. Yeah. And one of the, one of the reasons why people listen to this podcast, I think is because me and Brent, we didn't really, I didn't know this about Brent. I don't know if you know that we're right fighters. And so we just like for the right thing to happen all the time and to call out people in our culture, whether it be law enforcement or military. So you seem to align exactly with what we believe in. And I could see you becoming a reoccurring guest on the show to talk about some things that need to be talked about in our cultures. Welcome to the anti-hero family, Matt. Appreciate it. Can't wait to have you back on, brother. I can't wait to do it again. I, I, I had a podcast for five years and I got tired of talking to people. I like talking. <laughs> I, like, I like talking as a guest. Yeah, maybe next time you come on, we'll bring a couple seals. We got a big enough table. 